and don't make plans for Easter. That's what I can, I can tell you. The Premier warning he won't hesitate to lock things down once again as cases across the province intensify. Seizures are a tough part of daily life for people with epilepsy. We'll tell you about an eight-year-old girl in Windsor and her family fundraising to help. Take a live look outside right now. You can see already the river active as always. 19 degrees with the sun. Collect Kennedy is going to have the forecast for us, but we'll also have a story tonight on how the Suez Canal backlog could have a local impact. I'm Chris Ensing. Thanks for watching. The Canadian government is pledging millions of dollars to continue operating a COVID-19 recovery centre in Windsor for migrant workers who get sick. This after confusion around who should be funding it in the first place. But some say this doesn't do enough to solve the bigger problems that workers are facing. CBC's Dan Takama covered the announcement today. He joins us now live. Dan, can you tell us a little more about what this means for the region? Well, Chris, this has been a real sticking point for the city. They've been calling on the federal government to step in with more funding for some time. Now, here they are, coming in with nearly $18 million. Now, that money means the 125-room site that's already been serving temporary workers since the summer can continue to operate for the next year. The announcement comes more than a year into the pandemic, after more than 1,000 farm workers tested positive for COVID-19 in Ontario, and three who contracted the virus died. It is a national disgrace the way that uh, workers are treated. That was Health Minister Patty Haidu in June 2020, speaking before a Senate committee about stories she heard about migrant worker living conditions here in Windsor-Essex. Today... It gives me great pleasure to announce $17.8 million for Windsor to continue with safe voluntary isolation sites and supports for people who are essential workers. Before the announcement, the centre was at risk of closing because there were fears funding might stop as different levels of government argued over who should foot the bill. Last month, Windsor's mayor put pressure on the federal government saying the city couldn't afford it. Now local officials say this funding will make a big difference. This announcement today will go a long way to not replicate the issues that we had to face uh, in, in the great unknown at the beginning of this pandemic, and in particular when we hit uh, May and June of last year. Officials say the centre, which is staffed by the Red Cross, has helped a 1,000 workers so far. The area typically welcomes more than 8,000 farm workers each year. At one point last summer, the Mexican government advised residents not to come to Windsor-Essex because they believed it was unsafe. The federal government touted today's announcement as a way to protect workers, but an advocate says all levels of government need to be proactive. It's a year into the crisis and we still are reacting. We don't think enough has been done. Uh, we think it's been a, a, a systemic band-aid solution that hasn't addressed the, the root causes of the crisis. Ram Saroop says discussions about migrant workers need to involve them, not just government officials, and that housing reforms are also needed to ensure better living conditions on farms. And Chris, I did ask the health minister what has changed since she made that statement last summer about the way works, the workers are treated. She said the difference is that there's a better understanding in the industry around health and how it's important to keep the economy itself thriving. But she didn't get much more specific than that. Now, we heard the advocate there talk about being proactive, Dan. But what about vaccines? When will workers be able to get their shots? Uh, Chris, that's something that advocates have been pushing for, too. They say that workers live in congregate settings and that they should be considered a priority. You might remember last week, the province said it would like workers to be vaccinated upon arrival in Canada and that if the federal government didn't do it, they would like to. But there's no confirmation about anything actually moving on that just yet. Today, Minister Haidu said the decision is up to the province, but the federal government might be willing to step in. In fact, it's easier for the province, for the federal government to deliver that vaccination. We would need to work with our partners like the Red Cross and potentially other immunizers to see if we could do that. The minister says that would also mean a conversation with Ontario about the current vaccine sharing agreement. But the latest plan, uh, the latest is that the plan has always been to get workers their shots in phase two of the rollout, which is expected to begin in April. Now, we're hearing that there's movement on that, but when exactly that will happen isn't clear. Thanks for this, Dan. CBC's Dan Takama live tonight. Ontario is reporting more than 2,300 cases of COVID-19 today, and there are now more than 400 people with the disease in intensive care units and hospitals. Tonight, both the Prime Minister and the Premier are asking people not to get together over Easter. It comes as hospitals are being told to prepare for intensive care units filled 
beyond capacity. Jessica Ng has the latest. The variant is a completely different animal. It's, it, it's like a completely different pandemic. Dr. Michael Warner is the medical director of critical care at Michael Guerin Hospital. He says he anticipates the next two months will be tough for the province's intensive care units and worse than the second wave. Warner says COVID-19 related patients often make up more than half of his ICU and they're trending younger than before. Entire households are getting infected as opposed to just one or two people within a household because it's so much more transmissible. Ontario hospitals received a memo Monday urging staff to refresh your awareness and commitment to guidance given in January, which told them to prepare to surge capacity to 115%. A study by the Ontario Health Coalition says over the last two months, cases have risen significantly and workplace outbreaks increased 24% compared to 12% by community spread. It's especially concerning ahead of Easter weekend, when 30 to 50,000 churchgoers will likely attend in-person services at the 225 Catholic parishes in the Greater Toronto Area. Neil McCarthy of the Archdiocese says most of these events sold out within hours of reservations opening. So this year in the gray zones, we're uh, allowed to have 15% capacity and in red zones, uh, we have 30% capacity. So we recognize not everyone obviously who would like to be at church this week is going to be able to be there. Uh, so we will be drawing on some of the, the tools that we've used over the last year. Like live streams of church services, which have been adopted in over half of the city's churches. Politicians and doctors agree that though you can attend these events in person, you should instead stay home. If the government doesn't impose significant restrictions, I would uh, impose those restrictions on yourself. I think we need to think independently and not rely on the government to guide us because I don't think they've led us to a very good place right now. Jessica Ng, CBC News, Toronto. And here in Windsor, the local health unit is warning people to avoid gathering with others after funerals. This is the health unit investigates three new clusters of COVID-19. It's the fact that people, you know, are gathering and uh, it's hard to, to maintain that distance when you're trying to comfort someone. So I think it's just a natural, humane response. And, um, you know, people gravitate to support each other. There's no changes to the vaccine rollout plan here in Windsor-Essex following the latest news about AstraZeneca. Yesterday, the federal and provincial governments advised that it should not be used for people under the age of 55. Many in Windsor-Essex have already injected with doses of AstraZeneca, but they're all 60 or older. Hoping that um, we'll get more clarity whether this vaccine is safe enough for to use in the younger population or not or when uh, the other vaccines such as Janssen or Novavax or other vaccines that are currently under being reviewed uh, will, will, will be available to us. Our plan is based on the uh, Pfizer and Moderna for the mass vaccination clinic that's been con that will continue to happen and we'll continue to look at the evidence when it becomes available for the rest of the population group as we move forward with uh, more evidence coming out uh, uh, from AstraZeneca. An update on vaccinations here, about 19% of the population in Windsor-Essex has now received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Taking a closer look at today's number, there were 28 new cases of COVID-19 reported, along with one more death, a man in his 60s who was at a long-term care home and had a long history of illness. He had been back and forth to hospital several times. Ontario has now administered more than 2 million doses of vaccines into the arms of residents, but the Premier continues to take issue with Ottawa's vaccine deliveries, a situation that's become more uncertain because of the suspension of AstraZeneca. CBC's Chris Glover has more on the rollout. Touring the mass COVID vaccination clinic at the Downsview hangar, the Premier says the site will administer up to 1,800 doses a day. Clinics like this are vital to our provincial vaccination plan. Even after suspending the AstraZeneca shot for people under 55 yesterday, retired General Rick Hillier is still optimistic at his last press conference as chair of the vaccine task force. And I still believe that by the first day of summer, 20 June, given delivery of the vaccines, we will have a needle in the, in the arm of every eligible person in Ontario who wants one. But even that statement was hedged on supply. The Premier was questioned as to whether the supply issue is a veil for a bungled rollout. No, I, I don't play those games. We don't have the supply that we need. It's as simple as that. 
Ford pointed to Moderna vaccines delayed again and three mass vaccination clinics, including at Canada's Wonderland, having to pause operation. Plus, more than half a million AstraZeneca doses destined for Ontario have arrived in Canada, but the Premier can't get an answer on when Ontario will get that supply. This ongoing instability is the biggest threat to the success of our vaccination plan. But news of a suspended vaccine is fueling hesitancy. A lack of confidence in vaccines is a huge threat to this pandemic. Hematologist Dr. Medica Pai knows the fear building and the confusion. Researchers in Germany peg the AstraZeneca blood clot risk at about 1 in 100,000. But Canadian women have been pointing out the birth control pill carries a blood clot risk of 1 in 3,300. Thing is, the clots associated with AstraZeneca are completely different are extremely aggressive, they're extremely unusual, they are diagnosed differently and they're treated differently. With so few reports and none here in Canada, she says while the pause of AstraZeneca for younger people is warranted, the general risk of COVID itself is still way bigger. I can understand how the average Canadian's head would be spinning and, and would think, my goodness, these are mixed messages. And frankly, my head is spinning with all the information that I've been receiving in the last 10 days. But I think instead of thinking of it as mixed messaging, I think we really have to think of it as weighting the risks. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. The school spring break will go ahead next month in Ontario. We're building out a plan and we will be announcing it in the coming days to further strengthen the safety of children and staff upon their re-entrance following the April break. We're committed to expanding testing as well as stronger screening protocols before a student and a potential case enters a school. We appreciate the, the education minister there saying that the screening for COVID-19 will be stepped up in schools once students return from the break in April. That break was originally set to happen earlier this month, past, postponed though because of the pandemic. It will now take place April 12th. 14 countries, including Canada, have criticized a report put out by the World Health Organization. The report focused on possible origins of COVID-19. The countries who signed a statement today said the WHO report was significantly delayed and lacked access to complete original data and samples. One of the report's authors says getting access to more information is among their key recommendations. I, I see that again as a continuum in uh, working uh, closely with our uh, Chinese counterparts on on making best use of all the data that is out there. The report suggests that animal to human transmission is the most likely cause, but others, including a possible laboratory leak, can't be entirely ruled out. They didn't come to any conclusion. The WHO group spent four weeks in and around Wuhan, China in January and February. The report is being described as the first attempt to find out where the virus came from over a year ago. That big ship blocking the Suez Canal is finally out, but that traffic jam, it's going to have a ripple effect, and it might be one that are, is felt by farmers in Windsor, Essex. We've seen the shots of the ship, the evergreen, sideways in the Suez Canal. It's a world away, yet the jokes probably topped your timeline. Some are pretty funny. But the fallout will feel it locally. If we see in the next few weeks that ships uh, are delayed or not available, uh, people will begin to scramble. The Great Lakes are about to get busier. Spring opens up the seaway. This is also a critical time for farmers. Grain stored through the winter now being sold to market. But there's a problem. Ships used to get products across oceans are stuck in traffic. The problem we're going to see is a trickle down effect. In a couple of weeks, four weeks, five weeks time, we're going to find that the ship that we expected to be here to pick up the next load of grain and brought to the Middle East through the Suez Canal, it's not going to be available to us because right now it's still sitting waiting to get through the Suez Canal. It might be sitting there for another week, maybe two weeks, some people are suggesting. And that backs up the whole chain around the globe. Without those ships, grain will sit in storage. I'm sure the farmers want to sell their grain now. They were planning on selling it in the spring, and we were planning on loading it and moving it and selling it. Uh, I'm sure our markets had planned to receive it. He says the ripples aren't limited to exports. Thankfully, we're bouncing back, and our economy's heating up. Steel production's up. Manufacturing is up. And so as steel starts to flow out of, the, out of Asia and Europe, we will need those ships to bring steel into our port you know, for local manufacturing and construction, et cetera. And again, uh, there's a concern now, will those ships be available? 
The Port Authority doesn't consider it high risk, but it's something to think about when someone sends you that next meme. Epilepsy has not stopped a Windsor girl from living life to the fullest. The disorder has actually inspired her family to fundraise money to help others who are in the same situation. CBC's Marnelli Unchin has more on their story. <laughs> I would just help them um, to get through their rough times. Windsorite Ava Petrie has a mission. The eight-year-old and her family want to help those with epilepsy. It's estimated the neurological disorder affects one in 100 Canadians. It can cause violent seizures, something Ava experiences every night. When I have a seizure, um, I don't really feel it because like I'm sleeping. But Erin Petrie has tended to her daughter's seizures ever since they began six years ago. She falls out of bed, she hits her head on the wall because of her seizures, um, so her nights even if she sleeps for 11 or 12 hours, she's not actually getting that much sleep. Um, so her nights are a little rough, but she's a trooper. A few years ago, Ava was gifted an anti-suffocation pillow to help her sleep better. It's not approved by Health Canada as a medical device, but Erin says that their neurologist notes the pillow's design can help Ava should she find herself lying face down because of a seizure. That pillow has given us the ability to sleep again. The organization Epilepsy Southwestern Ontario also only endorses the pillow as something that can curb anxiety, which can trigger seizures. That's enough for Ava and her family. They want other kids to have access as well. So in the past four years, they've raised more than $20,000 to do just that, each pillow costing about $200. Now it's become a community effort. You can definitely see it's growing and like even me, people around me are like, oh, who's Ava? And I talk about her and tell her story and it's just people are like mind blown. And Christy Raymond is a family friend and runs a cake decorating business that's helped with the effort. She's known the family since Ava was first diagnosed. Even though while everything they're going through, the sleepless nights they have and everything, you they're still ready to like conquer the world together and they're always sticking together. And it's their an amazing family. I take my strength from Ava, 100%. Um, I could be having a bad day, but then I look at her, who's the one that actually goes through everything, and I'm like, well, how can I have a bad day when this kid is the one going through everything, and yet she still has a huge smile and ready to face the day. According to Epilepsy Canada, for 50% of people diagnosed with epilepsy, the cause is unknown. And for 30% of people, medication has no impact on reducing seizures. Ava belongs to both those groups, but the family is hoping that more awareness may one day lead to a cure. It makes me feel happy because I know I have like a supportive community. Renali Unchin, CBC News. Bye. And we want you to meet Lily Sege, 91 years old and she just got her COVID-19 shot last Thursday. That paper that she's holding there, it's a slip that her own mom received when she got a vaccine almost 100 years ago. It's a piece of her mom that she holds dear as her own shot gives her hope for an end to this pandemic after a tough year. Lonely. I mean, I have all the children. I have nine children. And, and you know, they call, call all the time. This one was perfect. I, it, I, I never felt anything and, and so far, it's only a few days away, and there's, I don't even feel where the injection went. You can always see the brightness in people's eyes when they start telling that story about getting vaccinated. Certainly a lot of hope when you hear and see things like that. And when you see stuff like this, too, a lot of people enjoying that nice sunny day we have now, and that's good because I don't think it sticks around. Glenn Kennedy with the forecast next.
Joining us now for a live look at the weather is Colette Kennedy. Colette, we just showed the river and everybody out mm -hmm. enjoying this beautiful day. It is just one of those days where you really want to get out there and enjoy that excitement. Yes, yes you do. I mean, we're certainly lucky with the weather, but you know, something else here that, Chris, I want to bring attention to, and that is just how lucky I am every day to work with you. I know how talented <laughs> you are, but who cares what I think? What's important, and I want our audience to know, is that Chris has now been recognized by the Canadian Screen Awards and nominated for Best Local Anchor for Windsor. So, a, Chris, congratulations. <laughs> pretty awesome. We're all pretty. It's great to work with you, Colette, and the team that we have. It's, it's a joy to come into work and see what we're able to piece together every day, especially during that last year. It was tough for everybody. It's very kind of you to say that. I'm just, it's, a, it's an honor to be in this city telling these stories, and uh, it feels very uncomfortable for me to be in this position right now, so I'm going <laughs> to let you take this away and tell I'll people how bright it it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it back. You Thanks, blush so off Clyde. camera then, but uh, we also know how hard you work, so this is uh, well-deserved, this nomination for Chris. Uh, okay, let's take a look at what's going on. Daytime highs here for southwestern Ontario, 19 degrees Windsor, uh, Leamington 19 as well, Harrow showing 19 degrees, so yeah, all Almost, just a little bit over, but not enough to round it up, at least at this point, to that 20 degrees. But our current temperature is still holding there. And then we get to see what's going on with these wind gusts. You know those have been kicking up, but they're also what's been pushing that temperature up. So very gusty. Uh, Windsor, we've seen some gusts over 70 kilometers an hour throughout the afternoon hours. And the forecast wind gusts, when are they going to ease? How about uh, shortly? Through the overnight hours, the cold front goes through. It brings these showers with it. But that's and those winds are going to be letting up. So even tomorrow morning, you'll notice the difference uh, as you're heading out. So we can see some of that cloud cover, though, that uh, moved in. Nice to have the mild temperatures, but uh, sunshine is good too, right? Well, the cloud cover ahead of the system, we're into obviously the warm sector. The cold sector has to sweep through. So as that front goes, we'll see some of these showers developing. The winds turn on the backside of this, although as I say, they kind of ease, not as strong. We'll get some clearing into tomorrow afternoon, but then some colder air filters in, and we could even by Thursday morning be looking at just a few odd wet flurries in our skies. Don't worry, as we head towards the holiday weekend, that high pressure moving in for Friday and bringing back the sun. Temperatures overnight tonight though with those wet conditions and some wet roads tomorrow morning early and then into the afternoon we should hit those double digits so 10 degrees but look at some of that colder air that's coming in there Thursday. Hey like today was kind of one day only that's one day only and then it starts to build again Chris for the weekend. No, oh, that'll be nice to see. Thanks for this Colette. Yes and congratulations again. <laughs> Thanks for your kind words. You're wonderful. <laughs> And coming up after the break, we're going to show you something wonderful, some famous cherry blossoms that are starting to bloom.
The trial of the former police officer charged with the death of George Floyd continued in Minneapolis today. The teenager who shot the video of Floyd's death arrest broke down in tears as she testified. He, he cried for his mom. He was in pain. It seemed like he knew. It seemed like he knew it was over for him. He was terrified. He was suffering. This was a cry for help. Ernella Fraser also testified that another bystander who identified herself as a city firefighter pleaded repeatedly with officers to check Floyd's pulse. But Fraser says the officer, Derek Chauvin, kept kneeling on Floyd's neck and he and another officer wouldn't let anyone get close. There's an early spring treat for residents in Washington, D.C. You're looking at it there now. The city's famous cherry blossoms are hitting peak bloom earlier than expected this year. It's due to the wall well above average temperatures that are recently in the region. You see them pop up there now. The U.S. National Park Service announced on Sunday the trees have reached the final blooming stage. Officials are encouraging people to view the blossoms from the live cam feed. That's it for us here at CBC Windsor News. Don't forget, for news anytime, you can go to our website, cbc.ca slash Windsor. We're on social media, too. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Rick Mercer Report is up next, but before we go, 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 before we go shouldn't have got nominated. Maybe I'd be able to read. If you take a look at these photos here from Katarina Georgieva, you'll enjoy the rest of your night, I promise. <laughs>